Hey, welcome to Church Experience Online. We're so happy you joined us today. As you watch this teaching video, if you have any questions or need help getting connected, please don't hesitate to reach out by phone or email. Also, our website is the best place to go if you would like to access helpful Growth Steps resources, join a serving team, connect in a life group, get your questions answered, or support this movement financially by giving online. At the end of this teaching video, you'll hear one of our Church Experience original worship songs, and we hope that gives you an opportunity to worship and reflect on what you learned. Thanks again for joining us at Church Experience Online. Great to have you here today. Welcome to Church Experience. And, uh, you know, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine, uh, a guy that, that I've seen serving here and actually one of our ministries, uh, Kid Experience, in just an incredible way. He's made a big difference uh, in his, uh, with so many young lives in the next generation. And so I, I'd love for you to hear his story because he serves out of the overflow of what God has done in his life. So uh, Stephen Wilson, could you guys welcome him? Come on, man. You got a fan club. That's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Stephen, uh, so you serve very faithfully in Kid Experience, and uh, God's really used you there. Um, that's coming from someplace. Tell us, tell us what your life was like before you met Jesus and started following him. Yeah, uh, if I could give you one word, it would probably be lost. Um, I was emotionally, like physically, everything. I was just lost. Um, I didn't know the purpose of life. I didn't know why I was here. I didn't know. It was very frustrating, emotionally draining, waking up every day. Just like, what is the purpose of all this? Like, it was just hmm. frustrating. So just trying to figure out life and, and kind of just felt like, I, I don't know which way is up. I don't know yeah. true north. I don't have like a direction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of people can relate to that. Um, Stephen, there obviously was something that changed because now where you're at now, following Christ and serving him. Uh, that story, I know it, is pretty funny. Uh, could you tell us yeah. uh, the story of, of what happened? What was the difference yeah. maker? Well, I love telling the story because it's <laughs> really funny. But uh, my girlfriend of eight years at the time, she basically said... Um, She'd been trying to get me to go to church throughout an entire relationship. I said, no, it's not really me. And then that eight-month uh, point hit, and she was like, you're either going or I'm breaking up with you. So uh, <laughs> I went to church, and here I am three years later. So a, a girlfriend's yeah. ultimatum led yes. you to Jesus. That's yes. awesome. Isn't that so beautiful? She, yeah. she likes to tell me. She likes to tell me that she won, but I'm eternally winning, so. <laughs> well done. Yeah. Julie, his girlfriend, Julie, well done. So yeah. if you don't come to church, like, we're through, and you came, yeah, and, then, I did. And, and you experienced when you, when you went to church, it wasn't, like, uh, maybe what you expected. It really uh, got, got a hold of your life, and, and so now tell us, like, what, after the fact, that God's changed your life now, and it's been a few years, mm-hmm. um, what's different, and what, why is it such a big deal that you're serving, and, and actually, I'll tell you guys, too, uh, one of the kids told us, uh, and Stephen's up front leading worship in the kid experience area, and uh, one of the kids said, Stephen is their favorite worship leader, and so that's kind of a big deal, uh, and tell us why that's a big deal. Oh, well, yeah. Um, like months ago, I couldn't even hold a conversation with someone, let alone stand in front of a room and speak, so uh, it's definitely the personal growth coming to church, uh, just being more comfortable in my own skin. Uh, that's one thing. Um, that comes a lot from the relationships that I've built being here. Um, I was first When I first started coming to church, I was like, an in and out type guy, like don't talk to anyone. It's like still that socially awkward kid. But um, you know, all the relationships that I built, they really they give me confidence. And it's like iron sharpens iron. When you're around those people, you kind of like become more like them. And you know, that's really shaped me into the person I am now. Man, that's incredible. Yeah. Could you guys give it up for Steven for sharing? Thank you, bro. Thank, Thank you, you, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. I love hearing about what God is, is doing in, in people's lives, and I hope he's at work in your life. I believe he is. I believe he's drawing you closer to himself, and I hope that today will be another day where you take a step closer to him. And we're wrapping up this teaching series today called You Asked For It, and we've been discussing the big questions that we all have, and last week we talked about probably the number one question that people have, why does God allow suffering? And it's such a big conversation, we wanted to make it a two-week conversation, so we're wrapping up with that today. Why does God allow suffering in the world? Or why do bad things happen to good people? Why does God allow for pain? And it's, it's a great question, it's a challenging question. Maybe you have some spiritually lost friends who've asked you that question. Maybe you've sat alone in a dark room after you've experienced some pain and, and asked that question of yourself, God, why? Well, interestingly, we had this message first planned on September 10 right before the hurricane came through and canceled our services. And so having a natural disaster blow through your community, it kind of elevates the stakes a little bit when you're asking the question, why God? It was interesting to me last week having our services back up and running again. 
uh, getting to talk to people after the service and uh, uh, all three uh, services throughout the day and just asking people, hey, so uh, did you survive the hurricane? How, what, what, what happened? And people telling me all kinds of crazy stories throughout the day. Uh, w- one guy told me that he showed up at his workplace. He walked into the, the offices and there was a hole in the ceiling right above his desk, like just above his desk. Uh, a panel blew off the air conditioning unit and everything leaked through. And so all his stuff, his desk was soaked. And he's got a journal notebook thing there that's kind of like drying out. I mean, literally it's like, why over my desk? Kind of the whole feeling, like my desk, like crazy, right? But probably one of the worst stories I heard was uh, a woman told me that uh, she and her two kids evacuated, and they were in South Carolina and were going to come back, and I don't know, they'd maybe parked in the wrong place or something, and ants infested their car, but they need to get back to Florida. She said, literally, Brandon, it was thousands of ants in our vehicle, like talking about ants climbing out of the air conditioning vents while you're driving coming out of the doors, coming out of like the, the, where you put the seatbelt, I mean, just everywhere. They are, I mean, your car's infested. She's like, we tried to get rid of them. Uh, we did everything we could, but I mean, it was still like you're driving down the road and you're like killing ants for hours, for hours while you're getting back to Florida. I mean, you know, I mean, it was crazy. I mean, you're in your car a long time, but the whole time, like they're just ants crawling all over her and her kids. They were miserable. And it was worse than that because they stopped along the road at some point Kids get out, stretching their legs, come to get back in, and one of the kids had stepped in dog poop, and that got back in the car, and then she's going to clean out and realize there's maggots in the dog poop, and that it wasn't like he went over there and stepped in it and came back. It was like right next to the car because now she's stepping in it, and there's ants everywhere, and it's like, this is a nightmare evacuation, right? And it's like, I have to hear story after story. People tell me all their different crazy things. Uh, but probably one of the, 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 the wildest stories uh, came from uh, the head facilities guy here at the school that we gather in. He doesn't attend our church, but we know him well because we, we've known him for a few years now. And uh, he's a great guy. And he, he showed me some pictures of his house and how a tree had fallen right on his house. He showed me how a branch went right into his daughter's bedroom. Thank the Lord, everybody is safe. But, I mean, imagine that kind of scenario. And so he doesn't, I don't think, even know this yet at this point. Uh, We get to surprise him. But we as a church, we say, you know, we we put the word out there. We've actually been able to help several families, and we want to meet some needs. But like this guy, we want to really help him. He's he's really been a part of our community in a sense by helping us every week uh, be able to have access to this building. And and so we are going to give them, uh, they're waiting on an insurance uh, adjuster to come. They don't know the whole story, but they'll at least be an insurance deductible to pay. And so we're going to give them $1,000 just to bless their family. They don't know what's coming, but isn't that kind of cool that we get to do that as a church? I'm pretty fired up about that. And you, you know what, when, when, when a hurricane rolls through, when you, know, you walk into your office and like there's one ceiling tile uh, that's missing and it's over your desk and your stuff's the stuff that got soaked and you're like, God, why me? And I think, that, I think that's one of the most challenging questions, right? Why me? God, why now? If the car had just gone a little bit that way, then they wouldn't have hit me and there wouldn't have been an accident if God if I had been a little ahead of schedule or behind schedule then this whole thing wouldn't have happened God why did you allow this storm in my life why did you allow this suffering this problem and it's probably people's biggest question if they were to ask God a question you asked for it kind of question they would say God why why pain why suffering why couldn't you change things up a little bit or if you're following Jesus why couldn't you just make the road a little, little smoother for us and not have any problems once we believe I mean why do bad things happen to good people and it's a great question and uh, you know probably a lot of us you know we're, we're so uh we're so tired of dealing with pain and we're so, we're just ready to kind of like, you know, the suffering in this world where it's like, man, it's just, it's just too much, you know, surrounded by it. You know, I was thinking when, when I was told the story about the, the ants in the car and all that stuff, I was like, dude, I just would have lit the thing on fire and I would have walked home. I was like, burn it, man. I just, you know, and we kind of get to that point, right? With, with suffering, we're like, man, I just, I don't know. I don't know if I can endure it. And and, and, but the thing is, we live in a world surrounded by it. We can't escape it. It's, it's, it's around us. It's, it's part of this world that we live in. So, so how, do, how do we deal with it? And Andy Stanley, uh, we talked about this last week. He said the core of the question is, if God is good, then he would. If God's really good, if he really loves us, he would stop suffering, right? And, and, and if God is good, and, and if he could, uh, not only would he, but, but he, he could actually do it. So he has this power to stop suffering. So, so why does God 
if he has the power to do it, which we believe he does, and if he's good, which we believe he is, then why does he allow suffering? And we talked about how he said that there's no rational argument against the God that Jesus presented in the Bible based on God not allowing suffering to happen to good people. There's no rational argument against God. There's no good reason to not believe in God just because of suffering. Because our whole faith is built on something really bad, crucifixion, happening to someone who's really good, Jesus, who is perfect. That's our foundation of our faith. Something bad happened to someone really good. In fact, he went on to say that you know, our, our whole faith never would have made it out of the first century had we had this belief that bad things don't happen to good people because, as we talked about last week, all our heroes died. Jesus and all his close followers, the disciples, they all died. And so, so our faith is actually built on this principle that this, there is suffering in the world and also that God can bring good out of bad. And in fact, maybe you, you want to write these two lessons down. There's, there's kind of four lessons in this, this message, and we covered two of them last week, but maybe you weren't here and maybe you just want to refresh your. So let me catch you up. We talked about how God can bring purpose out of pain. How God can, can elevate a purpose despite the pain that maybe we're going through. And, and he can bring good out of bad, and, and he loves to do that. And Jesus' life is a perfect example of that. Something amazing happened out of something horrible. And sin, the second lesson is sin brings suffering into the world. We talked about how God didn't create the world uh, with the purpose of having suffering because he delighted in it. It was the consequence of our sin. Our shortcoming and our failure allowed for sin to happen in the world. So, so sin brought suffering and, and brought pain. It brought death into our world. And not just Adam and Eve's sin, the first, the first two humans to sin, not broader humanity's sin, not just other people's sin, but our sin. We've all been partakers in that. And we talked about how God maybe allows a little bit of a taste of hell on earth sometimes so that we will avoid hell so that we will not want to experience the eternal consequence of our sin. And so maybe sometimes God allows a little bit of suffering to, to remind us of how brutal and painful sin is, disobedience to God, doing life our own way and what we want to do versus what God and his word says is right. When we do it that way, it leads to sin, which has consequences. And God allows suffering to warn us so that we'll know that our sin has a consequence. So that's kind of catching you up for where we've been this week. I want to talk to you about a story that is so um, amazing in its beauty, but so hard to understand why. Why, God? So Jesus was walking on earth, and he had a good friend named Lazarus. You might be familiar with this story. It's an epic one. Lazarus dies, a good friend of Jesus. And Jesus, who's fully God and fully man, so he experienced the same emotions that we have and understood the path that we walk and was tempted, as it says in the word, in every way that we are. He, he, he went and, and Lazarus had died and his family was there mourning and, and, and weeping. And, and it says in, in two dynamic but succinct words, it says the emotion of the moment, it says Jesus wept. And picture that, the son of God weeping, broken. Maybe you've been in the still uh, of the night and you've wept, you've, your heart's broken, you, you've, you've been there. Uh, Jesus was there, his good friend died. And, and it says that he wept. Even though he knew what he was about to do, he wept because there was mourning in it. There was sadness, and his family wept. There was suffering. And Jesus stands at the edge of Lazarus's tomb, and for our, our benefit, so that we would see his power, he stood there and he says, Lazarus, who had been dead for some time, he said, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus, who was dead, no heartbeat, no brainwave, act, brainwave activity going on, wrapped in linens, grave clothes, comes walking out, and he says, take those grave clothes off of him, and Jesus brought him back to life. I mean, that's, that's incredible. I mean, a dead person coming back to life, and that's going to get your attention, and it did, and a lot of people started to believe. A lot of people saw this miracle, and they were blown away by it. In John chapter 12, verse 11, it says, for on account of him, on account of Lazarus, Many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. So because of the suffering, because of the pain that one experienced, another could have life. So uh, a friend of mine who's a pastor lost someone in his close extended family, and he was asked to do the funeral. And he said at the funeral that, you know, I know that this person would want me to share the gospel, the message of Jesus at this funeral. And so he did. And six or seven people made a commitment to Christ at the funeral. 
And he said it was a great example of God bringing life from death. And, and here's, that's what's happening. Lazarus has died, and God is bringing life from death. He's bringing good from bad. That's what, that's what God does. He brings good out of the bad that we experience in life. He opens up possibilities. He opens up potential when there's pain. In Acts chapter 5, uh, some of those first apostles, followers of Jesus who had uh, been with Jesus, they've seen Jesus die, they saw him resurrected, they saw him ascend to heaven. They were now sharing this message of Jesus, of course you would too, with everybody that they knew because they'd seen him, they'd experienced it, they, they saw him come from death to life and they're just, they're like, we got, this is the most important message we gotta tell everybody. Well, the Jewish leaders at that time, they were trying to, they had killed Jesus, they, they were trying to, to squash that, they didn't want this message of Jesus to spread any further, so they called him in. They said, don't talk about Jesus. They beat them severely. They flogged them. And then it says in Acts chapter 5, verse 41, it says, the apostles left the Sanhedrin. After they had been beaten for talking about Jesus, it says that they left rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering. You don't, you don't see those words together too often. Worthy of suffering. They've been counted worthy of a suffering disgrace for the name. So they had found joy in their suffering for Jesus. Now this is different than you and I suffering for doing something really dumb, right? So don't, don't like do something really like, like stupid and, and then like suffer for it and be like, well, I'm just, I'm grateful I can worship Jesus through my pain. It's like, okay, you shouldn't have done that and so you're getting the consequences of your bad choice. But this, this was a different kind of category of suffering. They were doing the right thing Maybe you've been there and you were trying to honor God and you were trying to honor Jesus and you were trying to take a right step and then there was suffering in your life even though you were doing the right thing. And Jesus was the ultimate example of this. He was trying to save the world yet he went through tremendous suffering as he was persecuted and then executed. And here's the question in your notes that I'd love for you to wrestle with this week. Am I open to God possibilities connected with pain? Am I open? This is, this is an easy question, but it's really hard to come to a conclusion on that, right? Am I open to God possibilities connected with pain? You know, when pain comes into your life, you, you have a question. Am I, am I going to get bitter from this pain or am I going to get better? Am I going to find a way to bring good out of this? And, you know, sometimes we're so busy asking the question, why God, that we miss a more important question when we go through hardship. When, when we're, we're, we go through suffering, we miss a more important question. The question is not why God, and that's, that's one that naturally comes, and we're, we're discussing that these couple weeks, and, and I, I think there's, there's some answers, but there's some mystery to it. We don't really know all the why question answers, but there's a more important question than why, and that's how. God, how are you going to redeem this? God, how are you going to bring good out of this bad? God, how do you want me to respond to this pain in my life, this suffering, this hardship, this unanswered prayer? God, I'm giving it all over to you. And so God, how do you want to use this bad situation? And it might be a result of just that we live in a, a sinful, fallen world. It might be why you're going through a hardship. It might be because of your own sin. It might be that you're doing something good, but you're experiencing hardship because of other sin. So many different ways we experience suffering, but that one question will help you no matter what way you're experiencing. How? God, how? God, how do you want to use this? How do you want to redeem this? This might even have been meant for evil from the enemy, from the devil. It might have been some kind of attack on my life, but God, how do you want to redeem it and turn it? How do you want to use this bad for good in my life? God, how do you want me to respond? See, that, that word how is it's a very powerful word, and, and why sometimes stops us from ever getting to how, because we're saying, why God? And we're stuck on why, and we're kind of wallowing in self-pity, and why did this happen? But it happened, and you can't change it, and so how? God, how do you want to use it? Last week, if you're here, I, I told you the story about the incident we had when we were in, in downtown Atlanta. I had taken um, a backpack with me when we evacuated from the hurricane, and I had filled it with not only my laptop and, and several other important things, but I had filled it with all the important documents for our family that I did not want to get ruined if there was wind and water damage to our hurricane-hit house. And so I gathered up, imagine being very thorough and gathering all the important things, you know, that you didn't want to get ruined, all the important documents and 
all the family social security cards and birth certificates and marriage certificate and car title and marriage license. I mean, just imagine, like all the dozens and dozens of things of 15 years of marriage and all that in a backpack and someone busts out your window and they take it trying to look for valuables and you lose it all. And it felt like a punch in the gut, and I, I, but I, I mourned and moved on. I told you that story, I, I mourned about it and I moved on. Well, this last week I was cleaning out our vehicle and I put my hand under a seat to get something that I saw underneath the seat and there was a piece of glass under there that was not vacuumed out when we cleaned out the car and it had been left there unnoticed. And when I put my hand under the seat, it cut my hand and I looked and I had some blood, just a little bit, but a little blood that was coming on my hand. And I was reminded, I was drawn right back into it, why that glass was there, how it got there, someone busted out a window, what was taken from me. And maybe you have some reminders in your life that bring back past suffering, that thing that happened when you were a kid, that, that horrible loss in your life and you sit at the table and there's one less person and there's an empty chair or an experience you had that always comes back when you're in that place or at that time of year or when you're in that space or season and, and you're reminded of the pain. And, and so how do, you, how do you get past that? How do you move beyond that? Why God? Why did that have to happen? That was so, you know, I, I think you start to ask things like, God, how do you want to redeem this? I don't really know all the why because it seems like, God, it could have gone a number of different ways. And, and, and I do I understand I live in a sinful, fallen world. There's other sins. There's my sin. Sin has destroyed this and ravaged this world from what God created it to be. So, okay, we, and it's just that's the way it is. And, God, you can bring purpose out of pain. But at this point, I, I don't really know all the, the answers to why. But what I will say is how, God, how do you want to use this? Because if you get stuck on why and you're going through suffering in your life and you just stay on why, you'll never get to how. And on the other side of how, there's incredible redemption for, from God. Amazing things that he wants to do to take the horrible thing that happened on the other side of why and turn that into a, an amazing thing that he uses on the other side of how. And, and God's great at this. This is what God does. Author Lee Strobel said, God took the very worst thing that has ever happened in the history of the universe, deicide, the death of God on the cross, and he turned it into the very best thing that has ever happened in the history of the world, opening up heaven for all those who would admit their sin, follow Jesus. So he took the very worst thing in the world, in the history of the world, and he made it the very best thing in the history of the world. Surely God can take our negative experiences and turn it into something positive. That's, that's what God does. I mean, that's what he specializes in. Like God's amazing at that, taking bad and bringing good out of it. That's just what God does. And so when you, when you look at your life and you say, okay, this is, this is what's not going well. This is the things that, that, that I, I'm experiencing pain in, suffering. I, I'm not sure why God I think it's our role to move past why and say, God, all right, how? So, so it's here, and I can't change it, and it's, it is what it is. So, so how? how? How, God, do you want me to respond? How, God, do you want to use this? How do you want to bring good out of bad? How do you, you got, God, you let me know. I, I may not understand why, but, but I'm going to ask you for a how. Probably one of my favorite stories in the Old Testament comes from the back fifth of the book of Genesis. It's like right at the end of the, the book, and it's a story about a guy named Joe. And uh, Joe, Joseph, you might know him as, uh, he, he was a favored son among a dozen brothers. And Joseph was so favored that his other brothers were jealous of him. And who is it says in the word can stand under jealousy because it's a powerful thing. And his brothers, they were so jealous of him being the favored son, they decided to get rid of him. They thought about killing him, but instead they sold him into slavery and they shipped him off to Egypt. He finds himself in this foreign land abandoned by his family. Well, in that foreign land, if you know the story, uh, he was in the home of a very affluent and influential man named Potiphar. And Joseph was favored because he was faithful to God and he was a great man and, and he was put in leadership over time of that entire household. The one thing that he didn't have access to, of course, was his master's wife. Well, his master's wife took notice of him, came to him and begged him to sleep with her because he was a righteous man. And he didn't wall around in misery. Why, God, why did you let me be sold into slavery? He said, I'm going to honor God. God's with me. I'm still going to be faithful to God, even in this foreign land, even in a bad situation, even when they're suffering. I'm going to keep my character intact. I'm going to honor God. I'm not going to sin. The Bible says to sleep with anyone but the 
uh, a man and a woman who are married together, anything outside of that is sin. She's not my wife. She's married to him. That's sin. I'm not going to do that. She falsely accuses him. He does the right thing. She falsely accuses him. What happens? He gets thrown into jail. For doing something good, he's thrown into jail, falsely accused. So now he's in jail, falsely accused, abandoned by his family in a foreign country. How would you react? What would you do? So you've, you've been sold out by those you love. You've done the right thing and honored God with your character, and then you've been thrown into jail. How would you respond? Well, he remains faithful to God. And over time, he meets someone in prison. They build a relationship. That person gets out of prison. He's in the king of Egypt, the pharaoh of Egypt's service. The pharaoh, through a supernatural set of events, the pharaoh needs something. The man attending pharaoh who used to be in prison with Joseph says, I know a guy. (laughs) A lot of things start with, I know a guy. And I know a guy, and he pulled him out of prison, and he stood before Pharaoh, and that was his moment, and he didn't even say, well, I can help you. He said, I can't, but God can, and God used him and set him up over time through, again, a supernatural set of activities to be second only to Pharaoh in all of Egypt during a time of abundance that led to a time of famine, and God used him to govern the land, save up all this food in abundance so that people didn't die in the famine. Well, of course, in the famine, his brothers come to gain food because they didn't have any, and they find themselves standing before, without even knowing it, on the front end, they stood before their brother asking for grain, and they didn't even know it was him. The one they had sold out, the one they had almost killed, was now their lives were in his hands. When they find out it's, it's, it's their brother, they're filled with fear. But listen to how Joseph, all of that backstory for this powerful truth from Scripture, Genesis chapter 50, 19 and 20, it says, Joseph speaking to his brothers, you intended to harm me. But God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So when, when we look at the suffering in our life, when we look at the pain, we, we have to ask and, and honestly deal with this question, God, God, not why, but God, how do you want to use it? Joseph said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. So even when others intend to harm you, Even when life seems difficult and uncertain, God has potential that's buried inside of the pain. And if you could, with God's help, unearth the potential, the purpose, you're not always going to see it on the front end. You might not even see it until eternity. But maybe God is unearthing and doing something in the hardship that's going to allow uh, lives to be changed, for people to be in heaven. Maybe, maybe God's doing something through your, your pain and your, your challenge, your, your, your uh, discomfort that's going to impact the world or lead to a better life for you. See, when we ask the question, how do you want to use this to God, it opens up so many opportunities. Hebrews chapter 12, it tells us that, that God disciplines us. One form of suffering is, is consequence of our sin. So we do something that's wrong and we experience the consequences of it. And and Hebrews chapter 12 tells us when that happens, the suffering in our life is actually a good thing. It's actually a good thing. And you're like, well, how is it good that I'm experiencing this consequence? I know I did this and now I got to do this and I went through that and so now I got to go through this. And I don't see how it's good though. Let me share with you uh, Hebrews 12 verse 5. It says, and have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves. That's so important that you hear that. The Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So God allows you and I to go through suffering because he wants good for us on the other side of it. 
One, one form of suffering, one of the reasons why God allows that, it's, it's discipline. That doesn't mean every bit of suffering we go through is because we've done something wrong. In fact, that's not true at all. And there's some, many times where you'll experience suffering and you did the good, good thing. And we've, we've talked about that. We've covered that ground. And Jesus is a great example of that. He did nothing wrong and he experienced suffering. So that's going to happen. It's part of our world. But there is a form of suffering that's discipline. Where, where I'm not in alignment with God's will. So I'm going down life and I'm like, I know what God wants me to do. And I'm like, but I'm going to do this because I want to do it. And I don't know about you, but I'm a master at justifying my sin. So God, I know you want me to do this, but see, here's the thing, God. <laughs> see, God, I've thought that through. And if I do this thing, then that's gonna happen. And you wouldn't want that to happen, God. And so you, you really probably, I think, God, I'm gonna just do this and you just, you just stop me, God, if you, know, you don't want me to do I'm just gonna go ahead and do this, <laughs> right? Have you done that before? Or, or we tell God our plans, you know, and he, he tells us what he wants us to do. And we're like, well, God, see, here's the thing. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do it like this. And I know, I know you said to do this, but I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do this and, and let's just call it a holy experiment. And I'm gonna just see how this goes and, and we have all these reasons. We justify our sin. Like it's, it's clearly, you know, whatever it is that's going on in our life. And we're like, well, God, this, this, this is because of this and this happened and this and this. And, you, and well, God, I mean, certainly you would understand, God, you're a forgiving, compassionate God. And we, we give him the whole litany. But the reality is God allows us to suffer when we step outside of his plan so that not because he wants to prove his way, it's, it's because he wants us to get on the right track. Because there is no path through life that's better than God's path. You won't find it. You'll find yourself at some point in your life, hopefully not when you've already wasted all of it, wandering through the wilderness down a dead-end road in a roundabout at the end of a cul-de-sac and you didn't get where you wanted to go and you're, you're hitting that wall and you're like, okay, God, why am I experiencing suffering? And you know what Hebrews says? It's because, it's because of this. Your sin led to consequence and that consequence was loving discipline of a father. A father who loves his kids disciplines them. I love you so much that I want to allow you to experience a taste of what will hopefully change you because the ultimate destination of not turning from your sin is an eternal consequence. So God in his kindness, he disciplines us because he loves us and it says if he didn't love us, he would just let us go in our sin. So we talked a lot about why, we've talked a lot about you know, suffering in, in a broader context. But let's bring it back to this, this lesson, um, this closing lesson in this message. If I'm going through suffering, what does God have to offer me today? If I'm going through hardship, if tomorrow I get an unexpected phone call, if next month I have an unexpected event, if a storm builds and blows through my life, God, what do you have to offer me when I'm going through it? And maybe you come today and crash in your seat because you need something from God. And you're like, I have this unanswered prayer. I have this thing in my life I don't know what to do with. What has God offered? Here's the lesson that's in your notes. God gives strength and he gives peace during suffering. He gives strength and he gives peace during suffering. See, God, God is there with us in the storm. And he wants to empower us to get through it. And he wants to provide peace despite the uncertainty of our life. The author of The Reason for God, Pastor Tim Keller, he says, we don't really know the answer to all the why God allows suffering question. We, it's still a mystery. But he says, what we, we know now is, that the, is what the answer is not. The answer is not, and it cannot be that God doesn't love us. It can't be that he is indifferent or detached from our condition. God takes misery so seriously that he was willing to take it on himself. So God loves us so much that he would be willing to, to take it upon his own son because he loves us that much. That's how much God loves you, is that he took on misery. He took on pain. He allowed his one beloved son to go through the worst that you can imagine so that he could give you better than you imagine. That's, that's what God thinks about you. When we were moving down from Michigan to Florida to start church experience. We spent seven months in Georgia. And it was a little rest area that God had provided for us to have our fourth baby so we didn't have to birth a baby and a church at the same time. 
It was a time to prepare and envision this church, to fundraise, to get ready and take all the years of experience and the church that we had pastored and kind of figure all that out and how's it gonna work and start a new church. And, and before we were honestly gonna move down to a place where we didn't know hardly anybody and, and begin this process. And we knew it was gonna be hard and uncertain and difficult. And so uh, in that season, we were seven months, we, we roll into the north suburbs of the Atlanta, Georgia area and we're gonna be uh, working at and, and connected with our partner church, 12 Stone Church there. And, and there's someone in the church who has a very nice home and they have vacated it for a season and they rented it to us. A beautiful three-story home, two stories and a basement and we, more than enough room for our family of six to come in five at the time. We're going to leave with six. They roll in and unload all of our stuff and our, and our truck. We filled the basement up. We unpacked a few things, but we knew we weren't going to stay long term. But man, it, it sure felt comfortable to like unpack and have a couch and, and, you know, have a little baby crib. And we're there and we have this baby and we're getting settled and we're like, it's kind of nice here. We kind of like this, this church we're a part of, you know, and we're, we're getting a little comfortable, you know, instead of being on the edge of our seat, maybe we're starting to kind of relax a little bit. And, and, you know, it could have easily seven months could have turned into seven years. It could have been a, it could have been longer than a rest stop, but we're getting comfortable one night, uh, you know, have a good night's sleep, wake up the next morning and we walk down the hall and we see something in the hall. And we're like, what, it, what is that? It's like some kind of, I mean, we had spiders, you know, up in Michigan too, but that doesn't look like a spider. That's kind of big and that looks weird and nasty. And we get up close to it and it's like, it's a scorpion. And we're like, they have scorpions in Georgia? Are you kidding me? That, like, that's, that's crazy. They have scorpions. And, and so we're like, we're like, kill the thing. We get rid of it. We do a little research and sure enough, there's scorpions there. And like, man, I, that was like, kind of blew my mind because I was not expecting a scorpion in our house and we got a newborn and, and there was, uh, we wake up many nights. They, they move around in the night. And so they, they've been all over the house and you'll, you'll find them. It's in our stuff in the basement, crawling through things, probably crawling on us, crawling through. Well, our baby woke up with a big red welt on, on their arm one night and we're like, man, this is, a, ah, you know, this, this wonderful house. We're, like, we're trapped in here with all these scorpions. Like, and we just became uncomfortable. You know, we had the place sprayed a couple times, but didn't get rid of them. There were so many. There's just a lot of places. Had them all over. And, and, and the, the guy that came to spray it one time, maybe the second time, he's like, you know, he goes, you're not going to get rid of these scorpions. This is like, you guys live right next to the woods. Like, you're going to have scorpions. And we're like, so we just got to know how to live with it. And he's like, yeah, that's just kind of the deal. And we're like, man, that just, that sounds horrible. And, and we, were, we were a little bit uncomfortable. And his words left us hopeless. You can't just kind of get, get rid of them and they're going to be around them. It's just, they're here. And it, and it felt a bit hopeless. You know, when we go through pain, sometimes God is allowing us to be uncomfortable because we're trying to make this world our home. And he says, I got something better for you. This isn't supposed to be your home. And if, if, if there was no suffering in this world, maybe, maybe you would make this world your God. Maybe this would become an idol and you would get so comfortable here, you would make this, you would, you would start living for this world. One of my friends, Pastor Kevin Queen, he said, he said, you know what, we never decorate a hotel room. Why? Because we don't plan to stay there. It's not our home. But you know, it would make no sense, right? If you rolled into a hotel room for one night or a week, it wouldn't matter if you went in and you went out to Pottery Barn after you got settled and you, you bought a, some furniture, you bought some pictures and you, you came back and you started putting the pictures up in your hotel room and put some, some couches. It wouldn't make any sense, right? I mean, it would be crazy. Why? Because you're not going to stay there. And you, don't, you don't get to keep it. It's just for a season and then, you, and then you leave and then you go home. And you know, this life is a lot like staying in a hotel room. that You don't get to hold on to it. And you can, you can decorate it, make it all pretty. You can do some cool stuff with it and have a good life and all that. But listen, this, this world, this is not all there is. This is like a short-term thing. This is like a finite opportunity. And it's, and it, and it's here and it's gone. The Bible says it's like a vapor. It's like a, it's like a breath and it's, it's gone. It's like a wildflower. It's beautiful and then it dies and it's done. And that's this life. And so don't, don't get so comfort-seeking that you start to think that this world is your home. Because it's not. And maybe God allows suffering sometimes so that we don't get too comfortable, so that we, we don't sit back in our seat, but instead we, we move to the edge of our seat and we're reminded that we're here for a mission, that we're here for something that matters more than comfort. We're here because we have a calling. You know, first to find Jesus, but then to follow him into all the world and make disciples, to help people follow Jesus. And that we do have a home. We actually have a home that's far better than this life. God has a home prepared for his followers that is beyond what any of us can imagine. There's no more pain. There's no more suffering. There's no more hardship. And, and that home that God has for you, if you follow Jesus, if you've acknowledged your sin and following Jesus, that home, heaven, is not only without pain, but it's better, what the Bible says, is better than what any mind has imagined. What any eye has seen, it's better. 
I don't know about you, but I can imagine some pretty incredible places. I mean, I, I can't, I can, and, and I, I've been to some amazing places, and, and I've, I've seen some of the best that this world has, but it's nothing compared to what God has for those who believe, and it's unending. So when you get there, you can go ahead and get comfortable and unpack because you're going to be there a long time. It's called forever, and it doesn't end, and that's like, it's amazing, and that's what God has for you. So this world is not your home. You actually have a better home. This is a little stay. This is a little trip. And, and while you're here, God has something very important for you to do. Once you find his love and you start living for his love, he wants you to share that with others to help more people experience life in Jesus Christ because that's the best life there is. And even though that life has suffering to it, even though that life has hardship, that's only going to last for a moment. But what God has for you on the other side of this life is going to last forever. So let me just ask you this question. What are you living for? Are you living for this life or are you living for something that's unending and eternal? And maybe as you're going through hardship the next time around, it's never easy, it's never, it's never comfortable. But while you're going through it, maybe you'll be reminded of this closing verse I want to read from John chapter 16. And it will be reminded that God gives strength and peace in the storms. John chapter 16 Verse 33, Jesus himself says to us, he says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Despite your problems, despite your pain, that you'll have peace. And he says, I've told you these things so you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. You will have trouble. You will have trouble. So he promised us that there will be trouble in this life. So not Really, why God? You already told me it's going to happen. It's more, okay, God, so there, there's, there's going to be problems. But take heart, I have overcome the world. All right, God, you have overcome, so show me how to overcome this situation. God, show me what you want to do. How do you want me to respond? How do you want me to live for you? How do you want me to shine Jesus in this darkness I'm going through? Lord, your will be done. See, when you submit your life to Christ, it won't be without problems, but you'll have a tremendous peace. You will have God's presence with you. And, and you won't be without difficulty, you won't be without pain, but you will find an unbelievable purpose worth living for. And God will see you through it. He won't abandon you in your suffering. He's got better for you. We say the best is yet to come because we believe it deeply. But while you're in it, God is there with you and he's walking you through it if you'll stay close to him. Right on. Thanks for joining us at Church Experience Online. Please don't forget to check out the website if you'd like to get more connected, learn more, get your questions answered, or support this movement financially. You're now going to hear a Church Experience Worship Original song, and we hope this gives you an opportunity to worship and reflect on what you learned today. the power of all, but you washed our feet, though you were right to rule, became serving king, became serving king, in love you came here, laying down your glory, you were fighting for me, you were drawing
laying down your glory You were fighting for me You were drawing us near Invited to your kingdom Living in your freedom In love you came